Human Centricity in Healthcare. Good afternoon and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. I'm following a list of speakers who've spoken about some really interesting stuff about uh, data and about an individual self uh, distributed identity which we just heard and also some really interesting uh, work on wellness that I just listened to. So wonderful uh, sp speeches so far. Um, I'm going to talk about something much simpler. I'm going to talk about um, just what it is to use uh, a human touch uh, and bring it to medical technology. Uh, I'm going to share some of my experiences and also talk about, uh, you know, what led me to this. Um, is this good? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really going back in history here, <laughs> a quote from William Ostler. Um, the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. Uh, it's a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. Um, why I say this is that when I speak to several hospitals, and I've been meeting some of the hospitals in this geography as well uh, in the last few days, and one of the things that comes up often is that um, how do we make our business sustainable? How do we make this thing work in a way that we're not losing money? And, um, you know, I, see, I kind of look at it and say that, you know, you can't really be in this healthcare only to do a business. You really need to look at uh, it from the heart, and that's where I think uh, the point of uh, Osler comes up. Um, uh, that little graphic you see there um, is done by my daughter. Uh, she has an NFT on it. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, I've tried to illustrate uh, how uh, technology and um, biology can come together. And that's the next quote. Um, I'm just quoting Steve Jobs here. And, um, you know, he always believed that the uh, biggest innovations of this century will be intersection of biology and technology, and we're seeing to make, you know, see that happen. So we try to communicate that in this illustration here. And human term means uh, being human, yeah. Uh, so how do we go about doing this? And when I work with my clients, what do we try to do and uh, what have we discovered? So we've discovered that it's often about understanding the social, emotional, and contextual dimensions of the problem. Um, for example, if you look at in this geography, a lot of times what we've heard and in the interactions that we've seen is that um, unless you take into account the um, social and emotional considerations, you don't really have an answer to the problem, right? Um, there's such an expectation um, that if a clinician does not do the most expensive procedure on you, then there's something wrong. We should have actually done something more expensive. And that's a very irrational expectation, but that is what, you know, people who are sort of living in a society in a particular kind of strata believe. And they want that expense to be done at that level for them. Uh, so, you know, I've had scenarios where patients have told that, you know, this doctor didn't write a single test for me. There must be something wrong with this consultation. But there was absolutely no need to write any tests. Everything doesn't need to be going through the most expensive procedure or um, diagnostic test. Um, we were talking about wellness, and we were talking about you know how uh, people will use Fitbits, and there was this question asked, and it's a very interesting question. So I'm going to try and answer that question, uh, which was that which is the next technology which is going to be really the best technology for uh, wellness? and is going to be, uh, you know, um, the future of wellness. And I, I say that, you know, if you give a really simple answer, if at a population level, it's just an effective use of a weighing scale. 
If everybody was to take their weight regularly, we would you know, solve the biggest problem in the world, which is about obesity. And the other thing would be that if we could find a way to influence people's minds, and we could have a technology that can tell, hey, keep off that you know, extra plate of cheese. You've solved a lot of health problems in the world. So uh, what we need to be able to tap is the emotion, whether the, the emotion is about being scoring more points in a game or uh, you know, being appreciated by your neighbor. I think that's the kind of emotional context that we build, need to build into the solutions that we provide. So um, the, uh, the kind of approach that I uh, advocate is that whenever you're trying to solve a problem, start with empathy. Uh, unless you've had a baby who's premature, uh, you don't know what it is to go through that experience. You don't know what it is going to be to give that person a, you know, support at that time when the baby is born with just a one, one, one kg of weight, right? So what, uh, what you need to understand is put yourself in th those uh, shoes and then try to come up with an answer to the problem. And you'll find that there are very surprising answers. Because, you know, if, if for, for this example, I work closely with an uh, NICU, and one of the things that the parents said was that, you know, please don't put another device on the baby. Don't put another measurement, uh, you know, don't take so many blood pricks. We really don't know, uh, you know, why you need so much, my baby to go through so much pain. So we need to address these aspects when we, whenever we are designing a technology. So if we have something that is, um, non-invasive, uh, has least impact, it has most chances of being accepted. So I think we can do that with the newer technologies. We can be increasingly non-invasive. We can be more, um, you know, less painful for everybody concerned. And we can reimagine the journeys and uh, we can do a different kind of care orchestration altogether. Um, okay, so we were talking about chat GPD and I said, let me ask chat GPD, uh, what would ChatGPT say about you know my talk and what should I talk about? So it gave me this answer and it said you talk about you know how every medical device company should conduct user research and take feedback from medical professionals as primary users, incorporate use of universal design principles and conduct usability testing. Now, I'll give you an experience that I had uh, in the NICU. Um, there was this European company which had a clinically certified product. But when they came to the NICU in India, they did not realize that the patch that they were using to take the brain oxygenation levels of the um, child was too large for the Indian baby. The forehead of the baby was much smaller. And then you couldn't use this clinically certified product. So when you're designing a new technology, you really need to study the, um, you know, the population that you're going to address. Um, um, I think many of you would be familiar with this. A lot of people say, you know, let's go and acquire as much data as possible. But I don't think that really works. You need to really identify that the measures that you are measuring are the ones that are going to be used to bring about a change, a decision. Just collecting a whole lot of irrelevant data, it, you know, is not going to help you make better decisions. So you need to decide uh, and you can use a framework like this to come up with, you know, measure what matters. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this framework. Uh, what happens when you do not uh, pay attention to these small things in medical devices? And I think a lot of you would have heard about this FDA recall of Philips product, uh, the N60 um, CPAPs and the ventilators. Um, they were, they had to recall, you know, this large number of uh, devices. Uh, and the problem was only on one thing, that when the device actually stopped working, uh, I mean, when the power went off, it did also switched off the alarm. And the, uh, you know, they just didn't give a redundant power supply to the alarm, and they went into an FDA, um, you know, problem because, um, the people who died because the nurse who was overseeing the patient uh, did not get the alarm. So just keeping in mind, you know, what is the interface with the um, professional who's going to use the device is much, much more important, you know, sometimes than we think it is. And 
Okay, I'm done, is it? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think I just wanted to bring up one success story as well. And, um, you know, they've been, when it's done right, uh, it can create a really huge impact on medical technology. Thank you very much.